Welcome to you book channel. Read and listen to the greatest stories, that mankind has ever told. From Iliad to Covid Terror, and other famous classics. Enjoy, the best world literatures throughout history. Covid Terror Copyright 2021 by Jerry Ducatis All rights reserved. A unified Al-Qaeda and Islamic State, took advantage of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, in reinvigorating its jihadist cause for dominance, and the re-establishment of a caliphate. COVID-19 whistleblower, Dr. Li Wenliang, said. It has been confirmed, that they are coronavirus infections, but the exact virus strain, is being subtyped. COVID Terror Chapter 7 United Nations University Tokyo, Japan December 25, 2019 Professor Sean Gabriel Fitzgerald looked up from his table and blinked his eyes. The faculty room of the United Nations University is located near its library, making it convenient to borrow books and other reference materials. He is so absorbed reading Ian McHark's design with nature, that he failed to notice the approach of a medium-built woman, in a peach square pants and maroon blouse underneath a grey winter fur coat. The Japanese professor gave him a very amiable smile. You seem to be enjoying your winter break away from the States. Merry Christmas too, Professor Ryoko. This is the time that I can read my favorite books. Sage chooses to stay in UNU during school vacations. His apartment in the university has been reconfigured, to be that of a bachelor's pad. Though raised as a Catholic by a Filipina mother, who always insists that all family members must be together on holidays, he finds no excitement in the glamour of Los Angeles during winter. Professor Ryoko Byakuran is a research fellow, assigned at the Institute for Sustainability and Peace. A native of Hiroshima Prefecture, she handles courses and studies, related to global change and sustainable development. She took a seat in the faculty lounge. I thought I should visit you, when I saw in your FB locator that you're staying here. Besides, I have a present for you. From a paper bag, she brought out a wrapped object. Sage took a chocolate cake from the fridge. A bottle of Carlo Rossi came in handy. While having snacks, he opened the gift. It's a navy blue Sunspell Riviera polo shirt. He recognized right away the tailored cut with a breathable cotton mesh fabric, resulting in a simple top that's fit for summer. It's the shirt of Daniel Craig, for his role as James Bond in Casino Royale. Sage exclaimed in amazement. I hope you like it. I think it's perfect for the summer in California. Indeed, it is. Thanks. He seldom received a present from outside family members. Ryoko took out an Inmarsat ISAT phone too from her bag. After dialing an overseas number, she looked at him and asked. Professor Sage, would you mind receiving a call? Of course, my pleasure. A lot of personnel in UNU came from various countries, so it's not surprising, that some of his colleagues might wish him the best this Yuletide season. He took the satellite phone, and noticed that the international dialing prefix refers to the United States. This is code 9 of Project Red Mist. Agent Merckx, please identify. Sage froze in his chair. The voice is from a man with a title, case officer, in a secret telecommunications room somewhere in the George Bush Center for Intelligence at Langley, in Fairfax County, Virginia. The mention of a code number and project name, is intended for him to be aware that the caller is authenticating its identity, based on Sage's previous engagement in a government operation involving surveillance and monitoring of highly classified weapons of mass destruction of North Korea in 2016 only his own case officer, the CIA director, the National Security Advisor and the US President knew of Red Mist. Agent Merckx, 
as Sage is known in the CIA, replied plainly, is at 10.07 in Leyte Island. For an ordinary eavesdropper, the time and place is quite harmless. It seems that he is simply asking about the time, where the call is being done. But in CIA cryptography, the time stamp will be multiplied to a certain factor, to come up with his unique serial number, while the place refers to the geographical location, the last time company people contacted him. Even Ryoko, assuming she knows his true identity, won't have a way of decoding his personal agent identification code. After about 15 seconds, the caller came back at him. Welcome back to the company, Agent Merckx. Professor Ryoko Byakuren is in charge of Tokyo. She will discuss with you the case. When he turned his gaze at her, the Japanese academician suddenly changed her demeanor, from a jovial socialite to that of a serious intelligence operative. The fashion model looking professor, is the CIA station chief in Japan. She took the phone, and opened a website from a black hole DNS server specially reserved for CIA data transfer, in her Dell Inspiron 3000. She showed him a newly sent field report. This is a situationer from our station in Shanghai. The sender went to Wuhan in the previous weeks, and observed, that a lot of hospitals in the city were complaining of certain incidents, of patients experiencing a SARS-like infection. Sage noted that in the Intel dossier, a market vendor from the Huanan seafood market, believed to be infected with the coronavirus, visited a local clinic for medication of a malignant sore throat and fever on November 20. By December 1, another patient in the same city started experiencing symptoms like fever, chill, and myalgia of the suspected new virus. The next day, a 51-year-old Dongguan doctor suddenly had a cough and fever, and was hospitalized due to pneumonia with unknown etiology. Upon examination, he was found to have a lung infection, severe pneumonia, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and allergic purpura. She pointed out a highlighted statement. On December 12, a source from the China Central Television gave us a tip, that health authorities had realized that a new viral outbreak has been detected in the city of Wuhan. Within the third week of this month, one of our assets who worked as a nurse at Wuhan Jinyin Tan Hospital, reported that seven cases of people with severe pneumonia, were admitted to the intensive care unit. Sage noted in the report, that patient ICU-01 was not proven to be linked to the Wuhan seafood market, but the other six were either sellers or deliverymen at the market. They were considered to be the first cluster of patients, with pneumonia of an unknown cause. In all of these cases, the Chinese authorities, as usual, did not confirm the existence of an abnormal health situation. Ryoko said in disbelief. He nodded in understanding. That can be expected. Just like what happened in 2002, SARS infected more than 8,000 people and killed 774 in a pandemic that ripped through Asia, and spread to 37 countries. Yet, China's Ministry of Health tried to avoid discussing, how the outbreak started in the first place. Ryoko opened another file. The header portion is marked, Top Secret, Ziwajio Jimmy. This one came from Beijing's Ministry of State Security. The document is a facsimile of a MSS official communication signed by its minister. An extract in English text was presented by a CIA agent. Operation Purple Bubble The Chinese government requested the intelligence agencies of major powers, to help them locate and destroy a biogerm agent, initially termed as Virus X, that was stolen by an Al-Qaeda operative, disguised as a researcher, from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. This virus is a mutated strain of SARS-CoV. Prior to its loss in WIV, no one has an idea about it, except microbiology researchers from top laboratories in the world. Scientists at MOH and WIV were of the same opinion, that the existing coronavirus outbreak is not accidental, but a deliberate act of somebody, who was able to transform Virus X into a biological weapon. Sage looked at Ryoko. So, that's the catch. Yeah, I also thought it would just be another typical find and grab scenario. 
suppose we find the virus, or the laboratory where it's being propagated, how can we contain it? He is a trained soldier, not a germ warrior. The one in charge at the National Biosafety Laboratory suggested that we employ the expertise of the virus discoverer, a researcher currently assigned at the Institute Pasteur. Is it not Dr. Guinevere Del Pilar? She's also the same scientist that was recommended to me, when I asked last week the UNU rector, to whom could I ask for technical advice, on a certain curse given to me last November in Mexico City. He vaguely recalled reading a scientific paper, that a novel coronavirus was recently discovered, and being studied in China. That's her. I think my counterpart in France approached already the scientist, and made an invitation for her to join Upland Purple Bubble. If anything untoward happens, she knows the beast when she see it. It's only a 10-hour direct flight from Paris to Tokyo. She asked him, would it not be inconvenient, if you visit China by next week? The MSS has a science and technology investigative division, that is responsible for managing science and technology projects and conducting research and development. Its chief called me last night, that they have a lead where the rogue laboratory is located. Why do they have to do it on their own, instead of inviting outsiders and witnesses? My hunch is that, they want to do it for public relations. Of course, they have the muscles to demolish the lab, but with some foreign observers and international media around, it would enhance their global image of being intolerant to terroristic acts, especially in their own grounds and involving their own citizens. Ryoko also thought, that having some CIA eyes during the BioWMD recovery would ensure, that the Chinese military will be shy in putting it under TARP, and declare that the weapon is missing. Let's meet Dr. Del Pilar tonight for a mission briefing. A dinner and the warm ambience at the Suki Yabashijiro would be right, even if you shun their high-end sushi in a cold evening. At the same time, it's a good occasion to celebrate Christmas, for lonely souls like us. When Ryoko left the room, Sage went back to his book. McHarg presented a comprehensive framework of understanding the problems of modern development, and the presentation of a methodology or process prescribing compatible solutions. He agreed with the view of American ecologist Frederick R. Steiner, that the book influenced environmental impact assessment, new community development, coastal zone management, brownfields restoration, zoo design, river corridor planning, and ideas about sustainability and regenerative design. It's past midday when Sage finished reading. He went back to his apartment. The room is quite wholesome. An interior designer helped him in the decoration of a minimalist, yet highly functional space suited to his needs. He got a corner unit having an area of about 5 by 7 square meters at the UNU staff hostel. A mezzanine that serves as a bedroom, and accessible by a spiral staircase, nearly doubled his living area. The sala boasts an L-type sofa with a mahogany glass center table. Fronting it is a Sony X95G Smart TV, suspended at eye level in a brick-paneled partition wall. His study table is pushed near a fully stacked shelves of books, mostly on environmental planning, education, management, and economics. The lower layers are cramped with novels by Dan Brown, Steve Berry, Tom Clancy, Michael Crichton, Robert Ludlum, Ken Follett, and historical classics, as well as non-fiction like Douglas MacArthur's American Caesar and Eric von Manstein's Lost Victories. On the opposite side screening the kitchen and dining area, is a modern minibar lodging a collector's item of cognac, tequila, liqueur, rum, vodka, and whiskey such as Johnny Walker, Smirnoff, Hennessy, Jack Daniels, Bacardi, Absolu, Captain Morgan, Chivas Regal, Grey Goose, and Crown Royal. A portion has been allotted for wines like Riesling, Pinot Gris, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Zinfandel, Syrah and Cabernet Sauvignon. He fixed an olive sandwich and a Waldorf salad. A Japanese winter generally lasts from December to February. In Tokyo, the temperatures tend to be around 12 degrees Celsius in the afternoon, 
and drop to about 5 degrees Celsius in the morning and at night. The cold outside is intolerable. Snows were falling harshly on the glass panels of the building. But the room is comfortable enough to withstand the severe flu. A warm drink would be nice. But he had stopped his coffee addiction some years ago. So, he took a tumbler of Dewar's Double Double, recently advertised as the world's best blended whiskey, and slowly sipped its strong spirit. That's odd. He thought as he settled on the bar stool. He never expected that after three years, the CIA will be calling him back to active field service. Sage heard a ring. A call from Professor Ryo Kobiakuran brought his attention to the present. Dr. Guinevere Del Pilar arrived this morning from France, and she's staying at the Ritz Carlton. I arranged a dinner appointment with her. When I told her that I am connected with UNU, she mentioned about you, and your mysterious beads. She asked if you can join us. Of course, I'm excited to see her. I hope that she has also some clarifications about the Aztec curse. His Christmas won't be blue after all. Fine. I will fetch you from your place by 5 o'clock. We have a lot of things to discuss with the scientist, before your deployment to China next week. Suki Yabashijiro is a sushi restaurant in Ginza Chuo, Tokyo, that is owned and operated by Sushi Master Jiro Ono. It does not receive reservations from the general public, instead requiring reservations to be made, through the concierge of a luxury hotel. Featured on David Jelb's 2011 documentary film Jiro Dreams of Sushi, it is a very exclusive restaurant where U.S. President Barack Obama dined with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe on April 23, 2014. The Cocolistly epidemic or the Great Pestilence, is a mysterious illness characterized by high fevers and bleeding. It resulted to millions of deaths in the territory of New Spain, in present-day Mexico, in the 16th century. Gwen was explaining about the disease, that was unleashed by a suspected virus hidden in a mechanical lock system, of an Aztec treasure chamber. After the initial friendly gestures over dinner, the discussion moved from the trivial to serious issues around the world, but Sage was insistent. Doc Gwen, what's inside the lock mechanism? Sage can't help but stare in admiration at the pretty geneticist. It's something that everyone usually encountered with at home, rats. She replied curtly. What do you mean by, rats? When you sent me the specimen through UNU, I asked the help of my colleagues, what to do with a suspected germ agent from ancient time. They advised me to do it by a acid guanidinium thiocyanate phenol chloroform extraction. The AGPC is a liquid-liquid extraction technique widely used in molecular biology, for isolating RNA. In her iPad Air, she showed him an article of how the technique works. The AGPC relies on phase separation, by centrifugation of a mixture of the aqueous sample, and a solution containing water-saturated phenol and chloroform, resulting in an upper aqueous phase and a lower organic phase, mainly phenol. Guanidinium thiocyanate, a chowtropic agent, is added to the organic phase to aid in the denaturation of proteins, such as those that strongly bind nucleic acids or those that degrade RNA. The nucleic acids, RNA and or DNA, partition into the aqueous phase, while protein partitions into the organic phase. The pH of the mixture determines which nucleic acids get purified. Under acidic conditions, pH 4 to 6, DNA partitions into the organic phase while RNA remains in the aqueous phase. Under neutral conditions, pH 7 to 8, both DNA and RNA partition into the aqueous phase. In the last step, the nucleic acids are recovered from the aqueous phase, by precipitation with 2-propanol. The 2-propanol is then washed with ethanol, and the pellet briefly air-dried and dissolved in TE buffer, or RNASE free water. Sage just wanted the scientist to keep talking. Okay that's very complicated. But how did rats come into the AGPC technique? I'll make it simple. Look at these images. 
she brought up on screen several pictures. One shows the original image of the Aztec lock beads. Another is an image of what the beads interior look like. The third is a microscopy of the virus in artificial colors, and as seen through a microscope. I took the liberty of dissecting your mysterious curse. She looked at him, to make sure that she got his full attention. In the first picture, the beads were made of fine ceramics. The inhabitants of Mesoamerica in 1521 were expert craftsmen. It won't break easily, unless hit by an especially designed brass hammer. Take a look at the interior of a bead in the second image, with a powdery substance. The mysterious Aztec curse, is actually a pulverized Vesper mouse. The rodent, Calomis lacha, was discovered by scientists to be a host carrier of viral hemorrhagic fever. It could be that a certain shaman in the Aztec temple of Paitcatl, the god of healing and fertility, and the discoverer of peyote, discovered that the rat species was infected with something, that can cause a malignant fever and internal hemorrhage. When the emergency order of Moctezuma came to secure the imperial treasury, while the conquering Spaniards were still at bay, the Aztec artisans designed and invented the sunstone lock system. She tapped the last image and looked at Sage. Your Aztec curse is actually a powdered rat, that served as a viral vector, or ordinarily called, the tool that was used to deliver genetic material into a human cell, for an illness of new world origin. The coca listly has been thought to be an indigenous viral hemorrhagic fever, as there are accounts of similar diseases having struck Mexico in pre-Columbian times. It was exacerbated by the worst droughts to affect that region in 500 years, and the living conditions of indigenous peoples, in the wake of Spanish conquest in 1519. In your notes that accompanied the specimen, I read about how Fulgencio de la Maz, the thief who attempted to pilfer the Aztec treasury on February 27, 1545, died due to being pricked by the sunstone lock. What exactly caused the death of that crook? Ryoko asked timidly after catching the gist of the discussion. The thief died due to viral hemorrhagic fever, caused by a bisegmented MB sense RNA virus, that is a member of the family Arenaviridae. The people that he encountered and who died later, were also infected with arenaviruses. That could have been the start of a viral spread of the coca listli epidemic, which subsequently killed about 15 million people in Central America. Sage wanted to know a very curious phenomenon. What about an article I read? regarding the coca listly preferentially targeting native people, as opposed to European colonists. That's a very interesting question, Professor Fitzgerald. Call me Sage, please. Okay. I think you are referring to a book entitled, Secret Judgments of God, Old World Disease in Colonial Spanish America. There was a report from Gonzalo de Ortiz, an encomendero, who stated that God sent down such sickness upon the Indians, that three out of every four of them perished. It could be that the Spanish colonizers used indigenous fears to further justify and enforce Christianity. Ryoko chimed in, is there really such a thing as selective infection? Gwen smiled with pleasure, knowing that she's the only one in this table, who fully understood the complexity of genetics. The coca listly epidemics had proven, that a disease can target and infect a specific genetic trait. There were several historical records, which narrated that only the natives were infected and not the Spaniards. My initial laboratory findings of the arena virus taken from the Aztec sunstone indicated, that by isolating, then matching a viral RNA to a gene that is common for a particular sub-race, there'll be selective infection. There is a hypothesis, that the Europeans in Nueva España were immune to the virus, because of their previous exposures with diseases of zoonotic origin, like the bubonic plague. Whereas, the natives' genomic composition cannot cope well with the infection. This predicament was aggravated by the lack of water that altered sanitary conditions, and encouraged poor hygiene habits, in the midst of a mega drought between 1545 and 1576. The effects of drought, combined with the now-crowded settlements, is a highly plausible explanation for disease transmission, 
especially if the pathogens are spread by either human fecal matter or animals. It has been said that Christmas is a great time to be in Tokyo, with the presence of incredible lights and displays. Shops of every merchandise are always open. Although many Japanese are non-Christians, they enjoyed celebrating the outward trappings of Yuletide season, such as shopping, dining and decorating public spaces. After dinner, Ryoko invited them to come along with her, to the Rapanji Christmas Market, an event that is said to be the world's largest night bazaars. Apart from shopping, holiday revelers can enjoy some delicious mulled wine and a sausage, while strolling along the many stalls and booths. It's late in the evening when they brought Gwen to her hotel. In the car on the way to UNU, Ryoko brought out the essence of their mission. Dr. Del Pilar agreed to come along with you to China next week. You'll meet her at Tokyo's Narita Airport. The head of CIA in Japan does a briefing, as she handed him a China Eastern boarding pass. Are you sure she's up for the task? Sage has some doubts. We're to conduct a military operation, that may be very risky to civilians like her. I made an arrangement with my MSS counterpart, that the scientists should always be behind friendly lines, in the height of the operation. The only time she'll be involved, is when the laboratory and everything in it, are fully secured by authorities. Sage went to objectives. What will be her specific task? I requested her to do an extensive documentation of the facility, and if possible, retrieve and take possession of the biogerm agent. It's hers in the first place. What about me? Your job is simple. You'll babysit to the scientist, and make sure that no harm will fall on her. Sage looked at her with disdain. Can't any company asset in Beijing do that? None at all. Why? Sage knew that the CIA run a very extensive network of intelligence agents, in mainland China. The CIA noted your performance in Red Mist. That operation, along with your Delta Force combat experience against terrorists and anarchists, are qualifications enough for our handlers in Langley to decide, that you are best suited for the job. He wanted to anticipate any complications. I've been to this kind of thing in my previous assignments. It's always simple, nice, and easy at the start. But once the shit hit the flak, everything turns ugly. So, is there anything unexpected that may come out of the blue? I learned from MSS that her research team from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, will also be around to assist her. So, it would be better if you keep your eyes open, and exert some extra muscle to protect our own interest. What exactly is our interest? In this instance, our primary interest is to secure for ourselves the virus X, if an opportunity opens. We are coordinating with the Chinese in purple bubble. But the national security advisor, through the CIA director, ordered me, to acquire the viral agent, or keep tab of anyone that may be in possession of it. Adjusting the rangefinder of a powerful marine binoculars, Sage is leaning on a tree over a ridge overlooking an exclusive tenement, about a mile to the north of Dongbeikang. Based on GPS, the Chinese village lies in the outskirts of Puyang city in Henan province. The structure is just one among several luxurious buildings, in a large forbidden city-style imperial compound, that belonged to a retired PLA general Gu Keihao. According to a cook who acts as MSS informant, there were strange activities happening within the compound in the last few weeks. He's been with the Gu household for so many years, that's why he noticed the arrival about a month ago of Amira City Kui. That's Furin Sixi. The cook recalled saying it, as he recognized the image on TV. He can't believe that the woman that was introduced to them as the general's niece, is a wanted terrorist. In one particular occasion, he was told to get some expensive animal feeds, from a store of an online merchandise in Puyang. When he was about to deliver the goods to her, a security personnel named Jian took it from him, and warned that no one is allowed to enter the building, where the scientist is residing. Sage felt giddiness in anticipation of combat action. 
To his right in forward position, Alpha Company of the 11th Squadron of the Snow Leopard Commando Unit, are double checking their equipment and readiness. The SLCU is a police tactical unit of the People's Republic of China under the People's Armed Police, for any mission on counter-terrorism, riot control, and other special tasks such as anti-hijacking and bomb disposal. Shang Wei Chao Yun Chan signaled to him, through a crossed index finger and middle finger, signifying good luck. The Chinese team leader is in charge of the squadron, tasked for obstacle removal, bomb disposal, and anti-WMD terrorism. Right behind Sage Argwen, Dr. Zhou Meng and another professor from Wuhan Institute of Virology. The scientists were in hazmat suites and combat helmets, and an underlay of Kevlar vests. A hundred meters behind them, are three female snipers on loan from the SLCU 12th Squadron, for fire suppression and tactical support. These are the famed snow leopards in RPG video games. Captain Chow signaled to him, that it's five minutes before they will commence the assault. On recommendation from the CIA, and as a courtesy by the Chinese government for being a foreign military officer, Sage was given with a QSZ-92, a semi-automatic pistol for self-defense. On the appointed time, troopers of the 1st platoon of SLCU 11th Squadron, with about 45 men formed into three squads, each with about three fire teams of five elements per team. The entire assault complement is led by Lt. Su Liang Fen, while every squad is being commanded by an experienced sergeant. Captain Chow remained with Sage, Gwen, and the WIV scientists, to take charge of the overall operation as ground commander. Captain Chow performed the traditional pre-battle field guidance. We just received an intelligence report, that the GU complex contained about 80 to 100 mercenaries, a sizable private army of a former general of the People's Liberation Army. That's more than double the size of the entire SLCU 11th Squadron. Lieutenant Su voiced his concern. Although the Snow Leopards were highly trained in unconventional warfare, and can take a far greater number of opponents, it cannot be denied that their opponents should not be underestimated. I know. That's why, everybody should stick to routine, just do what you've been trained for. I don't want any heroics. Understood. Roar. The Snow Leopards operators growled in unison. Captain Chow took aside Lieutenant Su after dismissal. As much as possible, minimize the casualties, although you can expect up to 40% fatalities. Maximize the use of our firepower. But always be on the lookout for opportunities of a breakthrough. Civilians must not be compromised, and they are to be protected under the rules of the Geneva Conventions. Our objectives for this mission are simple, 1. Bring to Justice General Gu, Dr. Siddiqui, and their aides, dead or alive, 2. Secure Virus X without compromising the lives of the scientists, and, 3. Dismantle the rogue biotech laboratory. In a synchronized pincer tactic, the SLCU commandos positioned themselves near the three known gates of the compound. After Lt. Su gave the command to execute, the three snipers did the opening volleys, by downing silently all visible targets outside the fence. Simultaneously, leading elements of each squad placed a composition C4 plastic explosive to the metal lock of the gates. After molding into the desired shape to change the direction of the resulting explosion, the squad sergeants inserted a detonator. It took at least a minute, from the time the first target was felled by sniping, to the blasting of the gates. Once inside the compound, the SLCU commandos proceeded to their assigned targets. The intelligence report is accurate. About a hundred armed men, after being alerted by the bomb explosions, are now positioning themselves behind defensive works. Each mercenary is armed with modern and high-powered firearms, ranging from the Chinese Type 56 assault rifle to the VKS, a Russian bullpup, straight pull bolt action, magazine-fed and silent sniper rifle typically used by special forces. After three minutes of action, Sage can tell that their opponents are highly trained combatants. These are definitely rogue members of the People's Liberation Army, ground force. The firefight had 
come to a room-to-room -room brawl. In most cases, it would result to a hand-to-hand -hand combat using short blades and martial arts. The snipers from 12th Squadron repositioned to higher grounds, so as to get a direct view of the battle within the compound. The attacking forces had gained an upper hand, when they occupied two of the three major buildings. The surviving defending units made a formidable stand, in the last and newly constructed two-story infrastructure, that resembles to the Hall of Supreme Harmony in Beijing's Forbidden City. According to their informant the cook, this building is where General Gu, Sixi, and the scientists' personal bodyguards named Sharafia and Jian are housed. The attacking units of Captain Chow could not make a headway, as the entire periphery appears to be wired and booby-trapped. Two fire teams were almost blown to smithereens, when they attempted to rush and took the golden statue of Mao, at the center of an open space in the compound. A quick command by the squad sergeant to stay back, saved the troops from a deadly shockwave of a Chinese Type 66 antipersonnel mine. Reckoning by the sound of their guns, the SLCU commander estimated there could still be at least 30 bad guys inside the building. Meanwhile, five state troopers were already killed in action. A short command of lieutenants who reconfigured the SLCU's order of battle, into two oversized sections of four fire teams each, with about 20 elements per section. The first section will assault the right side of the building, while the second one will handle the left side. The snipers will focus their attention on the front of the building, and against any stragglers that may show. On scope. There is no way to escape, except if there is an unknown tunnel going outside the compound. This is a classic enveloping movement that is usually successful, but very risky. The final assault was bloody. Each opposing fighter is determined to prevail. Captain Chow noted that a third of his command had been decimated, after 15 minutes of action. Damn it, ladies. We don't have the time to stay here overnight, and sipped some refreshing tea in front of Mao's golden statue. Look for hard targets. He commanded the snipers to clear an avenue for the attacking forces. As you wish, boss. With some feminine motion, the Snow Leopards eased their Barrett M82A1 semi-automatic, anti-materiel sniper system into another position. The outcome was instant. The destruction of two Type 80 general purpose machine guns, blasting attackers from the porch of the second floor, finally gave the SLCU right section the window to storm the right flank, and enter the building with light casualties. The same attack pattern was done on the left side of the building. Sage could not take it any longer. He joined the assaulting troops on the left. A side door opened up to a series of rooms. SLCU troops did not waste time in opening the doors, rather, they simply sprayed the rooms with bullets. The last room is obviously a kitchen. Huddled along the food preparatory island, are three civilians. Bi Kai Chiang. A shout of don't shoot came from an elderly woman. Another bespectacled woman in a food smeared apron, made a hand signal pointing to an exit. Apparently, some targets of this operation had made a deliberate escape. A gardener, still clutching a water sprinkler, get up and assisted the old woman. Heard them out of harm's way. Lieutenant Su commanded some troops, to escort the three civilians outside the compound. Throughout the fight, there were nearly 20 non-combatants who have fallen in the crossfire. Sage was about to say something on detaining the civilians for a subsequent interrogation, but he cannot do so. They are pinned down by a renewed sniping, and automatic firing from the opposite side of the hall. Lieutenant Su came to a locked anteroom. He signaled for the converging troops to stay where they are. After asking for an exact amount of C4 and placing it within the lock, he placed a 30-second delay detonator, and ordered everybody to look for cover. The resulting explosion blew the heavy wooden door inward. The room contained what looked like an indoor satellite dish, an internet server, three high-end computer systems and other equipment. This is a communications center. The power of a shredding machine is still on, with some half-finished feed of documents. East Gallery, clear all clear. 
the most senior NCO in the right section, reported by radio to the lieutenant, on accomplishing the clearing of the rooms. Carry on. All teams, check arms, and restock. Lieutenant Su commanded his troops to prepare their armaments and ordnance for a final push. Captain Chow radioed the lieutenant, execute whitewash. In the MSS briefing, whitewash refers to an all-out attack to capture, dead or alive, the primary targets of this operation, General Gu, Sixi, and her aides. All fire teams fused together, for a combined assault on the second floor, where the shooting gets heavier. By quick head count, there were still 25 very able SLCU troops, plus Lieutenant Su in direct command of the outfit, and discounting the presence of the CIA operative. Earlier along the way in a room that looks like a private library, Sage was able to seize a VKS sniper rifle from a startled defender. He's about to take the sniper as a prisoner but it suddenly pulled a pistol, and aimed at him. He had no choice, but to pull thrice the trigger of his Chinese-issued QSZ-92. Being familiar with the rifle from his Delta Force stint, he manually reloaded the firearm from a box magazine with the capacity of five cartridges. This is the famous ghost weapon, the Russian bullpup, straight pull bolt action, magazine-fed sniper rifle chambered for the 12.7 by 55 mm STS-130 subsonic round. The only sensation of anyone being shot at, is the silent popping of flesh and cracking of bones. The Snow Leopard snipers are now ineffective, because it would be very difficult to distinguish friend from foe inside the building, even if they switch to CCD LCD technology telescopic sight. Thank you for watching. Write in the comments section, for your request as to what book, usually from Project Gutenberg, you want us to feature in you book channel. Click, like, to boost the rating of you book channel, make a comment for us for the improvement of our services, and share this video to your friends, with the copyright intact. Please click subscribe and hit the bell button to be notified of new uploads from uBook channel.